Hello, hello, welcome back to theCUBE. We're here at Open Source Summit in Vancouver. No, don't switch that dial, you're not on the wrong channel. I have been, John Furrier has been kind enough to uh, step aside and let me guest host this one, but don't worry, he's right there, making sure we all stay on our best behavior. Um, it's also Haitian Heritage Month, so it's only fitting to have a Haitian American guest star, so um, guest host, I should say. I am with the most amazing, group of panelists. We are going to tease our panel a little bit, which is tomorrow at 11.30, I believe, um, here at the Open Source Summit in Vancouver, and we're going to be talking about open source security, uh, our containers, the biggest blind spot. Open source supply chain security, our containers, the biggest blind spot. So that's the talk tomorrow. I'm here with three absolute security experts and open source experts, so I'm going to let them introduce themselves. Liz, why don't you start? Hi Lisa, uh, yeah, I'm Liz Rice, I am Chief Open Source Officer at Isovalent, which is the company that created the Cilium project. Okay, Aisha. This is Aisha Kaya, and I am the VP of Strategic Insights and Analytics at Slim.ai, a container optimization and intelligence platform. And Josh. And I'm Josh Bressers, the Vice President of Security at a company called Anchor. We do the Sift and Gripe open source scanners, and we like to call ourselves next generation SCA. It's a, it's a very exciting space, all this supply chain and open source. And supply chain uh, security has been a hot topic. There was a keynote about it this morning. I don't know if you, got, if you all caught that, um, the final keynote of the day. So this is a really hot topic. So if we want to, um, you know, one teaser uh, of one problem that we want to tackle for tomorrow, where would you start? No, I'm putting everybody on the spot. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> I mean, okay, so in your opinion, like, what's the yeah. weakest link, would you say? Because we're only as strong as the weakest link, right? I, I, something we were just talking about before we came on to this segment, the sheer amount of software that is out there, 29 million packages in Node alone? Yes. You know, and this so is that was when I did the research a couple of months ago, so it's no doubt well past 30 million now. And that's, a heck of a lot of software that may well be carrying vulnerabilities into everybody's deployments, and that's just one programming language. So I think there is the just sheer breadth of possible vulnerable software that's only going to be added to with AI generated software as well. Mm -hmm. So that's where I think, perhaps not today, but tomorrow, that's going to be the biggest weak, biggest weak link in my mind. Okay, perfect. And Aisha, what are you excited to talk yeah, about? I definitely think that this this is point of, there'll be no code than ever before with the AI generation uh, coming in. But I also think that the uncharted territory when it comes to vulnerabilities in the, these software packages that we have, that's also a, a big blind spot that we have. Because um, it's a very human, uh, generate human-focused um, activity, the way we find these vulnerabilities, a security researcher comes in and uh, does vulnerability research, and the sheer amount of code, coupled with the fact that uh, there is not enough security researchers, security reviews on, on these open source packages and containers and in general out there for all the software that we put out there is going to be, is, is a big, uh, big weak, weak spot, I think. Okay, perfect, Josh? Absolutely, and, and I'll kind of take that and we can go even farther. So I love data. Anytime I can, I take data and I see what I can do with it. I make silly graphs and, and analyze it. And all of the CVE data that exists today, I've taken and shoved it into Elasticsearch and looked at it. And it's kind of plateaued uh, around 20,000-ish vulnerabilities 25, per year. CVEs, it was 25,000 yeah. last year, right. And think about that, we just said there's 30 million NPM packages and 25,000 vulnerabilities that were published last year, that feels like it's off, it's missing some zeros, is the way I think of it. And this is terrifying in a way, because we already struggle to handle 25,000 vulnerabilities a year, when it should probably be maybe 250,000, maybe two million vulnerabilities a year, and that is terrifying, because right now, there's absolutely no way the industry could handle that, even if we wanted to. I think that's the other real weak link is once you've found a vulnerability, how do you apply yes. you know, the patches, the upgrades, keeping your software up to date. Yep. Everybody knows that it's good hygiene to do it, but the reality <laughs> of whether people are actually doing it, yes. very different story. I mean, in publicly available containers alone, right, 
we looked at the, the top images and when you look into the vulnerabilities that are introduced into the system and what happens six months later, about 20% of the vulnerabilities these, those CVs are resolved. 80% of those vulnerabilities that we see stay in these containers longer than 180 days. So our resolution, the rupture and repair cycles are extremely slow. Mm. So yes, the problem is not big enough. We don't have an army of security researchers, biological and non-biological entities looking at our code. But even right now, it seems to be we are challenged, like it, the, the problem seems to be very challenging. Uh, we are not coping up uh, with, with the current issues at human scale, let alone the AI generated code in CVEs. But now, here's the question I always have to ask. It sounds dire. We just spouted off a lot of terrifying statistics. Yet I can still log into my bank and pay my bills and I can have my dog food at my house tomorrow. So, is it really that bad? I mean, it's, th that's what I struggle with always internally, is it feels really bad, but society functions. And I know we, we're going to unpack this question a lot more tomorrow, um, but we're here in Vancouver and I'm watching the container ships go back and <laughs> forth, so I have to ask about containers. Um, and, and I know, uh, Liz, you've, you've raised this question before. Are applications inherently more or less secure in containers? The software itself is the same. Um, I think you know, there's, there's always this, uh, let's say, misunderstanding about how isolated containers are from each other and from the underlying system, and, and the answer is not very. You know, <laughs> so um, there's a little bit of a um, let's say catchphrase of, of containers are not a security boundary. I actually think they are a security boundary, but you have to be very careful about how you can enforce that. So there are tools that you could use to help you enforce a stronger security a boundary, whether that's your container runtime or like runtime uh, tools that are essentially ensuring that your behavior of that container sits within a certain profile. But uh, without that, containers are not as isolated from each other as virtual machines are or as you know full bare metal machines are. So yep. th there's always going to be a bigger security challenge. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I know John will, will be disappointed in me if I don't bring up one of his favorite topics, generative AI, I know he's a big chat GPT fan. Um, and so how does, and I know you're AI ML expert as well and, and data scientist. Um, so in terms of security, like what extra security risks or how are we dealing with security when we're adding in AI and ML? So first of all, last 15 years of my career has been in the intersection of data science and cybersecurity. And never in my career I have seen a technology that was born in the West Coast that diffused into rural India, rural Turkey so far. So it's very impressive. And I'm also uh, an AI ethics advisory board member at Northeastern University. So we've been talking about the generative AI and its implications from multiple perspectives for, for a while right now. The implications on security is going to be interesting because there are so many different dynamics, system dynamics of this issue here. So we talked about AI generated code. AI, yesterday there was this uh, announcement from OpenAI, they were saying that they're using GPT-4 to understand GPT-2. So AI is <laughs> beginning to try to understand itself, right? So there's that explosive nature of new code that's being introduced. The um, amount of code, that there'll be no code, uh, more code than ever before. So business, marketing, all sorts of departments are empowered to generate code. But I was a speaker at RSA last week, but I, you know, I'll say that the enterprise security teams are not that thrilled about everybody writing code, <laughs> especially those people <laughs> who are not very familiar with the security implications of the code. I think some enterprise code. security teams would prefer their own developers didn't write any code. <laughs> I would totally agree with that. And there's like, a, you know, we can think of it as, a, a, as you know, security, a security researcher being augmented by generative AI so that finding the needle in the haystack is easier. But you also can think of the other side, the bad actors creating more robust, malicious code, weaponizing AI. So, so many different dynamics. And, and, and for us, I think the, the ultimate, I, you know, I can talk about this topic for, for hours, but the bottom line here is that it is a time that we need to be very deliberate and intentional about our next steps. Because it is we are going to be empowered like never before. There is a ton, we will be doing a lot more with less, but the question is, are we ready for it? Yeah. 
And I don't know if you caught um, Eric Brewer's keynote this morning. Um, he was talking about uh, automation and uh, you know, curation especially, but he also talked about supply chain security and, and s bonds. So I know this is something you yes. know something about. Um, and uh, I saw a question you were talking about, are, are containers just somebody else's computer? Probably. I mean, this harkens back to what Liz just talked about. You know, what is the security boundary around containers? And I think, how many of us have just pulled random things from Docker Hub with zero insight into what was even in it or what it really did and we ran it on our laptops or our servers or whatever. And so it's software someone else put together. So I mean, is it someone else's computer? If you think of it in that context, it, it really is. Someone else built this thing and then we're just taking it and running it with almost no regard for what it actually is. Which is honestly true of a lot of open source where it, it's something we think it solves our problem, so we download it, we run it, and we see what it does, which is awesome and terrifying at the same time. And yep. we all think that somebody else is looking at it for security <laughs> That's issues. Right. And That's right. Yeah. Well, we know they aren't, <laughs> but everyone else thinks they are. Yeah. But maybe now we'll be able to have like AI looking at all of there this open source software, yes. so at least somebody will be looking or something. But do, do you think that 2022 has changed this dynamic a bit, John, because you know, after the, uh, like in the aftermath of multiple security incidents, people are not no longer looking at containers as these building blocks, these atomic units of um, just shipping guard. There's a lot right. more to it than being uh, that black box, simple black box. I, I feel like yes. Mm -hmm. And I see this professionally with the prospects we have reaching out to the company. I see it working with the OpenSSF. I see it in many places, and I, I blame Log4j for this. And I know Log4j gets brought up in every talk at something like this, but what I think happened and what I saw was a lot of organizations went, they said, do we have Log4j? They honestly didn't know, and they started looking, and they not only found Log4j, but they found open source everywhere they looked. Everywhere you look, holy cow, there's more open source, there's more open source, and so I think, that changed a lot of conversations into, like what are we running? We have no idea, we need to th figure this out because this is a big deal. And I know many organizations I talked to, they were measuring the time to just find Log4j in three plus months from the time Log4j began. Not, they had no idea what remediation was going to look like. So, I mean, you're probably talking years in many instances, which is kind of terrifying as a security person. Right. And since we're at Open Source Summit, maybe we should talk about some open source <laughs> projects. I saw your talk at, at KubeCon a couple of weeks ago. It was awesome the, on oh, um, eBPFs. You, I know you gave five talks, but uh, <laughs> I know you've written two books um, on eBPF and, and you talked about the Cilium project. Really cool project. Do you want to yeah. give us an overview? Yeah, so um, Cilium is probably best known for um, Kubernetes networking and it's built on eBPF, which is this incredible kernel technology that allows us to um, instrument the kernel, change the way the kernel behaves, and for networking, it allows us to create very efficient paths for network packets to, to follow within the system and also to uh, build in network policy so we can drop packets that are outside of a security policy. Um, Cilium's also um, actually being used in quite a few non-Kubernetes environments as well, so some uh, load balancing applications, and uh, also for uh, connecting Kubernetes deployments with legacy or on-prem services. I, I think multi-cloud has been quite a, a sort of hot topic this year. And um, it's certainly something that we're seeing a lot of user demand and customer demand for this ability to integrate their Kubernetes cloud native services with these kind of pre-existing, you know, maybe on-prem uh, services that they're still using and that are still very functional. Okay, and um, thank you. Um, and so I have a question for Aisha. The, um, I know Slim AI and iSolvent and Encore are also mostly container uh, tech, but what about non-container open source security? Uh, since we probably won't go into that tomorrow in the panel, um, what, what can we say about that today? I mean, in general, I think open source containers and the rest, I, it's a vast, varied, and complicated landscape. And from a security perspective, 
um, like for containers, we are seeing that after all the scrutiny, after 2022 being the year of software supply chain security in the aftermath of certain security incidents, um, the vulnerabilities and the complexity, the component complexity has been under rise. So there's a lot of effort, but it doesn't seem to be resulting in, uh, in a lot of uh, improvements in the code that we see. Um, and it's, it, it applies to other areas as well. So in general, um, my take is that you know, open source containers, um, the software that we use, all the other technologies, they're great for agility, efficiency, speed, but there, is, there are areas for, that are ripe for innovation, especially when it comes to vulnerability remediation. And um, I'm just so hopeful that uh, we, we use, we get empowered by generative AI to do um, the, uh, the, the human scale activities that we have been doing in unimagined, uh, unimaginable, previously unimaginable speed so that we can uh, tackle the problems that, that are ahead. Okay. I will add to that something the OpenSSF is working on which is a group I'm a part of, they're part of the Linux Foundation, so they're here, there's OpenSSF days going on right now as we speak upstairs, but they have a project they call Alpha and Omega. And Alpha and Omega are, Alpha is taking like the top 100 open source projects, now just figuring out what the top 100 projects are is, is a bit of an argument in itself, but they're taking kind of the, the very popular open source and they're sending humans to them and having like real security researcher humans help these projects, be it code audits or you know threat modeling, wh whatever needs to be done and helping improve their security posture. But then the Omega project is meant to take thousands of open source projects and start asking questions like, can, can we deploy AI to help us understand this? Can we deploy automated scanning to understand what's happening in these projects? And really trying to take that bigger picture view and obviously if we can do it for a couple of thousand, we can do it for a couple of million is the idea. And so there's it's a really interesting project and in fact, there was just, a, in, in the OpenSSF keynote, Microsoft and Google had both pledged $2.5 million towards Alpha and Omega to help further the project. So like, it's a big deal and it's really cool and it's definitely something to watch. Okay. I also just realized I didn't actually introduce myself. <laughs> I'm Lisa Marie Nampi. I'm a developer relations at Cockroach Labs and Cockroach Labs is the company behind Cockroach DB. Um, and we're all about meeting developers where they are, um, you know, giving you that flexibility and operational control. And um, we have a new release coming out next week that's going to address a lot of these security concerns, so um, you know that flexibility and that control is I think huge, especially when you're talking about security. So in case anyone was wondering why a database company is up here talking about security, other than the fact that I wanted to spend time with three of the most fabulous people on the planet, um, there, is, there is a tie in to almost every technology. Everybody's concerned about security, right? That's right. All right, we've got like a minute left. Who wants to, who wants the final word? crowdsourcing this out. I'm going to look at Aisha, because I know you always have something amazingly interesting to say. Oh, thank you. With, you know, Liz and Josh on my side. I'll just say that uh, open source and containers are uh, just like simply amazing. And I think there's a ton of opportunity for us to grab. I'm cautiously optimistic when it comes to generative AI and its implications for cybersecurity. But um, again, we need to be very deliberate with the next steps. Um, and, and this is the right crowd. Like we are stronger together and the brilliance of the people that are in this conference is just humbling. That's very, very true. Okay, so uh, from that, since I've, this is the first time I've actually hosted theCUBE, <laughs> I've been on it a few times, but um, I think we're supposed to say something like, thank you very much. We are coming to you live from Vancouver Open Source Summit, and this is theCUBE. Thanks, John, for letting me fill your seat for a hot minute. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>